All right, good morning. This is Dan with Tradingology in our trading room for November 12th. Had some couple audio issues, so we're gonna try it one more time and I see Greg coming back in already. So good morning, Greg, good to see you. I can drop the, open the video up too so you guys can see me. We'll see when Dave reconnects if uh, our audio is better or not. Cross our fingers. All right. We have been away doing things, so it's good to see you guys again. Get my chat box open here. There we go. All right. Market's just opening up here. Did you take any trades this morning, Greg? Or how you been doing in general? We've been away for a little bit. Never a dull moment around here. Make sure my coffee's working, there we go. We'll see if uh, if Dave's got connection issues, it might just be myself again, so we'll see. And he's coming back on now. All right, let's give it another whirl. Good morning, Dave. Bill sounds like a robot. Back to Greg. Type to Dave. Oh yeah, oh, Rick has gone for a while. That's always a double edged sword, right? Okay, does this sound any better? Now I gotcha. Now it's, you're loud and clear. I am? Yes. Okay, it's my microphone then. I I haven't used it for a while. I turned it I turned off my Yeti microphone or my blue my microphone. Yeah, I, the, the blue, those are beautiful. Huh. Okay, well I will investigate because the problem's on my side then. Yep, Greg's got it loud and clear too. Good to know. Yeah, it sounded like a beady 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 beady. <laughs> Oh, wow, that's weird. I don't know if I can duplicate that. Maybe you'll hear it on the recording. Hey, good yeah. morning, Dave. There he is. Good morning. You're you doing video. Go I might as well do video. There you go. I just have to put my good background because it's cold here, so watch out. Oh, you can see the back of my bald head now. <laughs> that's why we wear hats. I got to change that. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, All right. Do that. And I have shared the screen, correct? Yeah, so... I just turn this over this way a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know. I don't like to see the back of my head. <laughs> it's something you don't normally see. You see yourself in a picture, it's like, is that what yeah, I look like? <laughs> All right. All right. I can well, completely turn it around and you can see the snow outside. I was just going to say, we have had we had single digits last night. And uh, it's unusually cold here, so... Watch out for what you got coming to you. No snow, though? We've had a couple dustings. Nothing accumulated yet, though. Yeah. We got I heard reports of some places where uh, they got a half a foot already in some areas of Michigan, though. So you might be seeing that little lake effect coming. Oh, well, good morning, Greg. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, just traveling too much. It's just too much. Two weeks uh, is usually, I mean, I never go away for two weeks in a row. Uh, I'll travel for a few days here and there, or maybe a week at the most, but yeah, two weeks is too long. Yep. I feel so out of touch. Greg says he did some scalping on the ES with the daily scripts or the Renko scripts, I'm assuming, about a week and a half ago. Good, good. How's it working for you? Good. Awesome, man. Yeah, I had uh, I, I did some scalping yesterday. Uh, it, was, it was a pretty good day, but uh, I haven't done any day trading. I haven't done uh, I haven't really done much of anything. I've got uh, I still got the short positions on um, uh, MYM and MES, which are not doing very well right now. But I think that's about to turn around. Well, it's rather interesting. 
you know, the last couple of weeks with all the stuff going on. It's like, how far will this go? And how long can they extend it with these repo injections? It's really interesting. Yeah. So boy, you know, it seems like they can kick the can down the road as long as they want to. Um, the only real, really big news I saw this week, uh, over the past week or so was uh, Deutsche Bank. Oh yes. The Man, a, what not. Yeah. 18,000 employees. Oh, I mean, that's really crazy. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. I, I, uh, there was a video I posted, uh, last night on Twitter about, uh, it was the CEO of Deutsche Bank who talked about how messed up the banking system is and how negative interest rates have negatively affected banks. Uh, the whole trend there is really uh, starting to hit them hard. Uh, they just can't make any money. There's a, you know, I mean, typically what they do is they make the money on the spread, right? So they've got with interest rates coming to zero, where do they make their money on the spread? Right. Uh, it, it, it's getting very, very difficult. Well, yeah, just the notion of a negative interest rate just doesn't make sense in the first place just to wrap your head around it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, what is this? <laughs> negative interest rates, jeez. No, no wonder to see a, it's hard to make a business plan for it, yet, let alone just think about how it's actually going to work. Yeah. So while I was in uh, Vegas uh, at the World Crypto Conference, um, there was a couple of uh, different vendors there. One was Celsius, and I got to talk to uh, the CEO of Celsius. He did a presentation about um, uh, this new banking, really DeFi, uh, uh, decentralized finance system, and they're paying 7% on your crypto deposits. Wow. 7%. You know how huge that is? Yeah, you can't find that anywhere. No, you can't find that anywhere. I said, geez, that sounds like a scam. How can you pay 7%? I didn't say that to him directly. I just, <laughs> I just said, it sounds unrealistic to me. How can you pay 7% when the interest rates are like 0.01%, you know, everywhere else? And he said, what he's doing is he is charging, um, 14% to institutions to borrow that crypto. Oh, there you so, go. And then, so he's giving us 50% of that interest that he's charging to other institutions. And it's, I said, why would institutions want to borrow crypto? He said, what they do is they're, they're basically, they think that they can make more in the long run on their crypto than they can on, um, and, but they don't want to own it. They can't own it. So they are borrowing it basically. Interesting. They can they set up subsidiaries to borrow the crypto, and then I think what, what's going to happen is once we get enough legislation, if we get enough regulatory clarity, they will convert that to a, an outright purchase of the crypto at a premium. Um, and in the meantime, they can hold it. They can uh, get some appreciation on it, uh, but they're paying fourteen percent, which they don't care about at this point, I guess. Right. Um, Cause they think the appreciation could go hundreds and even thousands of percent. Um, so it's kind of interesting. So we get paid 7% if you want to. There you go. Deposit your crypto to them. Good morning, really Shankar. Huh? I was just going to say, Shankar popped in saying good morning. So I was just saying hey to him. Good morning. Uh, Greg says, Dan, I sent you an email this morning. Have you released the new VA scripts and the V3 of the uh, spreadsheet? Oh, did you get my email last night? I don't think I got yours. At least I haven't checked it this morning. Uh, Greg, I have not released them yet because I don't like the way they're shown exactly yet. As a default, there's ways you can manipulate them to make it look right. But I don't want them to have all the members or all you guys have to do it yourself. So I'm tweaking them before I release them. So they are coming. So just to show you, I got them on here, like the end column. And I'm just playing with uh, different settings. So I want to make sure. So obviously we're down here. I don't want the end column to be showing green and confuse people. So I'm getting that fixed up for you guys. And then they'll be released. So there is new things coming there. So yeah, you haven't missed it yet. I know a few people have been looking for that. So they are still coming. And uh, I think I saw your email about the, is it the formula? Is that the one you're talking about or a different one? Yeah, yeah the formula for the new uh, spreadsheet. Yeah, it's, yeah populating, it's populating that uh, next mm -hmm. one down because of the change in the formula. Yeah, so what we got here, I just got it filled out for yesterday at the V2 one. 
what we're talking about there. Let me. Yeah, I'm using I'm using the old formula for now, and if Andy's in the room, um, I'm not sure what the issue is there, but it's definitely an issue, a problem if we're going to go, be going forward with it. Um, what we might want to do is create a separate worksheet that has the new formula in it, and then populate the um, uh, populate the grid uh, sheet with the just the data. Sure. It's, Okay. Yeah, what we're talking about, the other reason that V3 isn't on there yet, on the slight refinement that we did, what we're talking about is uh, right here. Yeah. These actually pre-populate. This one I haven't filled in yesterday, so I can just drop in the number there. Yeah. But it's drawn down, so we don't want that to confuse people as well. So if they look at it and say, oh, look, it's, our, it's looking into the future, and tomorrow's going to be down, where it always just goes to the positive is what it does if I extend it down. But uh, So that's what we're talking about is for some reason – this change in the, the modification and how we're refining one more time is causing it to do that versus what it did before. So once we get those fine tooth combs figured out, we'll get them out there released for you. And if I you want to go back, that. go back to that just for a second, because um, we had some signals pop up when we got the, um, on the OB, uh, the overbought oversold indicator. Yep. Yep. So the, so the swing signal uh, turned up. Uh, on the 24th that we've had a pretty good run on to the upside for a while. Um, and that kind of, and we started to see the binary trend turn positive a few days afterwards. So. Yeah. That was the first time in a long time that we right. had on yeah. either side. Yeah. Since way back in uh, end of July. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go back in and I'm going to take a look. I also want to take a look at the low high and the VA spread and see what the, uh, stats on those are. I haven't gotten to that yet, but I, I'm going to really start to dig into that. So some good things are coming with that. Um, I, I feel that urge to go in and, and do a deep dive into those numbers. <laughs> There's always new things. And just to round out the last new things coming, I know you guys have heard a few or some people may have heard, but uh, I got a couple mock-ups for you. We're going to be updating the membership site. So here's a little brief look at what the, coming soon pages is shown right now that courses are going to be revamped and uh, making the learning better for, you know, people have different access to different courses and uh, nice. I grabbed a couple screenshots. So that's coming soon too down the road. Oh, good. Good. I like it. Awesome. So keep your eel eyes peered and eyes peeled and ears something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, whatever that phrase is. Right. Yeah. Ears pierced, I was going to say. That's what I was thinking, too. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to do that. And uh, if anybody took a VA trade, we always want to talk about that quick. Is uh, We kind of wish, you you know, 60-40 wasn't perfectly biased one way or the other, but watching it turn out with uh, the bias, there was uh, definitely a nice down move. I can just imagine Shankar probably grabbed on this, or Voltaire that's joined us now. We'll see if anybody got into this. We're uh, a decent move there right in the first five minutes. Yeah, there's um, we've got a number of uh, uh, biases up. The bell curve, the binary trend, the X column, and the overbought oversold has enough bias. The the H4 uh, had a down bias. The M1 had a down bias today, uh, right at the open. Uh, but it looks like the VA trend is starting to to go up a little bit here. No um, for Shane today. Gotcha. Yeah, we hit. There's um, I, I'm 100 convinced that there's uh, quite a bit of manipulation going on in the market right now. Yeah. Based on all the numbers that we're looking at, I mean, when we go through, uh, when we go through our, uh, uh, not only the spreadsheet for the market timer, but also for the, uh, uh, we're doing some additional uh, analysis of the market. And we're seeing quite a bit of manipulation uh, both in the YM and the NQ, not as much as on the RTY, but it kind of follows along. Uh, there is more selling going on on this rally than we've seen in quite a while. Uh, we're looking at the institutional sales. We're looking at large block trades. And uh, it looks like there's a quite, a, quite a bit of institutional selling going on as the market is ramping up higher. And what's happened, so... What they'll do is they'll bid up the, uh, the uh, contracts, the uh, futures contracts, 
uh, pull as many retail traders in as possible or less sophisticated traders, and they're selling those uh, contracts to them uh, and taking short positions in the market. Uh, we're, if it's possible, the market can continue to go higher because you never know when these guys are going to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're getting, I think we're getting to the point where um, they have to be pretty full with short contracts. And then the market's just going to tank at some point. Uh, and it's going to be pretty unexpected, I think. Exactly, Voltaire. That's how we can, that's part of seeing one of those indicators of manipulation where it's blatantly clear that price is not doing what it should be doing based on the fundamentals and what we're actually seeing. So you're dead on where that's why it's confusing to you because, hey, this shouldn't do that. You're right. It shouldn't be doing that. And the market shouldn't do things like that. Yeah. Right. The uh, everything that Market Timer does is is the measurement of supply and demand, and what it's doing is it's telling us that as the market is going higher, people are selling. I mean, large institutions are selling. That's why you're getting some sell signals. You're getting sell signals at this point, uh, but the market and the price isn't going down, and that is just pure manipulation. Um, that's part of the risk of. Uh, you know, being in the market, you really need to, uh, you need to be in a, <laughs> yeah, you need to, you need to be aware of how the market operates. It's not necessarily illegal manipulation, uh, because market makers can pretty much do whatever they want. Um, and if they have the, and you know, some of these guys, some of the market makers, you're talking about Goldman Sachs, you're talking about all these, JP Morgan, you're talking about really large players that have really deep pockets. And as soon as they stop their activities, the market's just going to decline very, very rapidly. Um, we think that this, uh, the latest, the last three weeks or so has been more manipulated than, than it has been since about Oh, October of 2018, which was when the market started to really go down just before that Christmas season. Um, so it could be worse than that. <clears throat> yeah, so don't be confused, Voltaire. It's not just you. It's you, you have insight that most people don't see. That's why it's looking interesting to you. Yep, absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind that that's exactly what's happening. Uh, of course, it doesn't help that, you know, President Trump comes out and says, oh, we got to deal with China. No, we don't have to deal with China. And it's like, that, that's kind of the good excuse, I guess, that, you know, market makers can use in order to push the market up or down. Yeah, I think I saw some questions about that. It's like, how is that not market some type of, you know, how is that not a problem or potentially illegal or not or some type of nefarious activity where, you know, manipulating just based on that? It's like, yeah, that's crazy. I don't think I've ever heard a president talk more about the market than, than he does. Right. Oh yeah. Never. Yeah. He, he's constantly referencing the fact that I think over the weekend he said, yeah, we made a new high and he's constantly referencing the stock market as, you know, as validation of his, of his policies. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not typical. No. Uh, well, another interesting, here's, here's something interesting. When I was doing, um, day trading back in the early 2000s and to the, up to 2008, I used a um, indicator, and you may have seen it some, on some of the old videos. It's the SPY minus the VIX on the, uh, on thinkorswim. Um, I looked at the ratio. The ratio is at about 24, so I've got SPY minus VIX times 24, and it's giving me a pretty good indication of what's happening in the relationship between the, the SPY and the VIX. So as soon as we start to see some, some heavy uh, purchases of puts and selling of calls, the VIX is going to go higher uh, in, in relation to the SPY. And so I'm waiting for that kind of turn right there. So this is another, this is an indicator maybe for the broader markets. Uh, and I think I'm going to create a spreadsheet out of this one because it's a pretty interesting relationship. Um, and it's predictive. So we'll keep an eye on that. I used it a lot when I was trading in those days and it worked really, really well. 
And I think it's going to be much harder to manipulate because the VIX, the formula for the VIX is based on both puts and calls on the S&P 500. So when, uh, even though they're manipulating the futures market, as soon as market makers go in and they start buying puts or they start selling calls, those premiums have got to rise and it's going to show up in that indicator. Interesting, interesting. In fact, I could show it to you if you want to share my screen. I can stop my side. It's all yours when you're ready. Let's see. Where's that little... I do not see it. All I see is your video. Uh, do, 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 do. Maybe I have to stop my video. If you just exit full screen, maybe if it's uh. No, that didn't do it. I usually see a button that pops up that says share screen. Yeah, let's see if I can. Oh, I got it. Okay, and they moved it. They always move it. Here it comes. There we go. How's that? Now we got you. All right, cool. So, yeah, so what I did was I took, just like we're doing with the VA trade, it's a ratio. And um, so yesterday morning, we had this big drop off in the SPY um, minus the VIX here. The ratio right now is at 24. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create this spreadsheet in order to, uh, uh, to get a longer term history on this. Uh, but what happens, because you have, you have the SPY, uh, the S&P 500 uh, ETF, and you have the VIX, which is based on the formula that I mentioned of putting calls on the uh, S&P 500. As soon as you start to see a little bit of a movement in that it'll be it'll show up in this chart. So I took spy minus VIX times 24. Yesterday we had the uh, sell off right up at the open. We're down about 100 points or so on the Dow, uh, and then we started consistently moving higher. I've got the uh, strong market price signals on here also as kind of an indicator. Uh, right towards the end of the day, though, we did see a little bit of a comeback, a little bit of a sell off here. We had some overnight action in the futures contracts, but right at the open this morning. Uh, we had another up signal, uh, and we and we've seen that continue to go higher. So it's a good. It's not only um, kind of a long term indicator, but also kind of a short term indicator that that you can use for trading. Uh, I'm going to put this into a spreadsheet. I think it could be really interesting uh, to see how this performs over a longer period of time, and it may help us get a better idea of. Uh, some of the market movements, um, you know, over a longer period of time. So here's the bottom. Uh, this is still on a this is on a 30 minute chart, uh, but this is the bottom going back to October 3rd. Uh, we had a good up signal here on the price signals, and it's continued to go higher uh, with just a few pullback here. Um, so if you guys want to put this into your chart, it's just SPY minus the VIX times 24. And I see you have that on the tick cloud, but a 30 minute chart. Is there a difference on why you prefer the, the tick indicator versus the regular indicator on the top half? I, because I had it originally on a tick chart, I just copied this over. So I'm going to change, I'm going to change okay. that. The tick, the uh, Renko uh, cloud tick chart, uh, uh, indicator does have some different properties. Um, in this case, uh, in fact, I may, I don't know, I might keep it there. It acts more like a moving average. The, the regular Renko cloud uh, does not act as a moving average. This one does. Uh, and so you get, it's a little, so it's a little bit different. I did have it on the, on a tick chart and that's where I copied this over from. Okay. Yeah. But, I'm probably going to change it back to a regular uh, cloud. And 
it doesn't seem like it would be uh, sensitive, really, really sensitive to the VIX, but it is. Yeah, it really is. So, How often do you look at modifying the variable, the 24, and where do you pull that from? Um, uh, at this point, I just took the price of the SPY and uh, divided it by the VIX. Okay. And that was, uh, just this morning or whatever? Uh, yesterday. Gotcha. Yep, just did it yesterday. And so just like when we do the YM minus the NQ, uh, if we don't use the ratio, we don't really get an accurate trend. Right. Yep. It's right. not going to portray accurately in the chart. You won't see it. Yeah. Yep. So right now we've got a little bit of an upturn here. We had a little, we had the uh, upturn uh, and, and it's starting to move higher, but uh, Kind of, kind of flat, but I'd like to see this in a spreadsheet. I want to see the trend over time. Should be interesting. All right. I do not. Oh, here we go. I'll turn that back over to you. Right on. Turn off my deals. And move you over here. All right. Yeah, so I, I've been I've been listening to a lot of guys who are talking about how the fact that, especially um, <clears throat> Danielle DiMartino Booth. I mean, she's been she's been on fire lately. She's really starting to do a lot more. She's having a lot more discussions about how there's no real price discovery anymore in the market because the federal reserve has been injecting so much liquidity and cash that, um, you know, to be honest with you, I a hundred percent agree with her. I think that the market is, is not really following a true price discovery anymore. Yeah. It's not a true market anymore. It's not, it's just, it's getting a little scary there. Um, you know, they haven't injected cash in a while. They started to call, you know, cut back on that last in the beginning of the year, and then they've had to completely reverse that. Um, I don't know how long they can continue to do it. I really don't. Uh, it seems to me that you know they've been doing it for so long now that they can't they can't really stop. You know the part that drives me nuts. What I was watching one of her videos that she did with one of the talking heads. And I understand she's got to be on there. I just hated the way this guy like completely manipulated the conversation because he's like, all right, so what I heard there is, so if we keep injecting, I don't think he said we keep injecting, but he said something to the fact of, you know, if they keep putting money into the, the repo markets and the markets keep going up, so are, are you saying 30,000, 30, Danielle? She's like, well, yeah, the markets are going to keep going up if they keep doing this. Okay, so I heard 30,000. That's what she says. Market's going up. <laughs> yeah. Like, you got to be kidding me, dude. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty bad. That is really bad. Um, and here we go, bubbles all over the place. New high, new high, new high, new high, all across the board. There's one thing that you have to kind of, you know, it's it's a little, every time you hear one of these interviewers, they they you know they craft the questions in a way to get the response that they want. And then they steer people towards these ridiculous conclusions that the person being interviewed had no, you know, is not in agreement with at all. Right. So they steer everything the way they want it to go. So if they have a liberal leaning, it goes liberal. If they have a conservative leaning, it goes conservative. They, there's very few people who are interviewing uh, that are totally objective. Yeah, not speaking like lawyers and, like you say, steering you down a path. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, let's see, what else we got? We got um, uh, MGI starting to move up a little bit here. We're Oh, yeah, I haven't peeked at those yet today. Yeah, MGI, RL, RLGY, hit it nice. It got, it got over $10, $10. And we're picking it up around $5. Uh, 350 I added to my position yesterday at 3.5. Uh, 
four five. I'm MGI, and it's up a little bit today. It's up to three fifty. Um, RLGY is down a little bit for the last couple of days, but it's had a fairly decent run uh, right. from around a five fifty area, which we started to accumulate in. Well, they had that fake out drop after the announcement, but it rallied right back above it. So I'm expecting the same thing to happen personally. Yep. And I have up signals on both of those on the weekly charts. That's primarily what I'm looking for on those two. The weekly charts both have an up signal. Uh, and then I've been watching uh, a new one here it is GoPro. I don't know if you started, to, I don't know if you pulled up a chart of that lately. I haven't. Yeah, GoPro was like 98 something. Uh, I don't know how far back that goes, but let's see. That was quite a while ago. So there's where it accumulated. Now we're getting close targets. So yeah, well. Yeah, that was back in 2014. It was at 98. And it's just been going down ever since then. But we're getting to the point now where I think it's uh, it's starting to be accumulated. Um, I'm keeping a really close eye on it. I'm kind of looking for a little dip back down to that 325 low, maybe at 350 to 380. Uh, I'm going to start to look at accumulating that. We'll fire up a new one here. Are they GPRO? That's what's their ticker? Yes, yeah, GPRO. Slightly counterintuitive that they've been going down, especially with all of the internet stuff. You know, everything. You know, everything is video on the internet. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, weekly chart, you can see where that ninety-eight dollars came back, came into, and in, back in uh, two thousand and fourteen. And look, it's just com continued to drop. Wow. Uh, you know, I haven't done any fundamental analysis, so I don't know. But their, I think their earnings, they're, they lost forty-two cents a share in their last quarterly. They had been losing. Uh, a little bit here. They had a, th a three cent positive quarter, the last one. Uh, but they've been losing money. Uh, and I'm not sure why, uh, but they've been losing money for a while. Uh, and then they have quarters in which they're making money. So um, I don't know if it's R&D, if it's, it's product development, it's marketing expense. I'm not sure what the deal is there, but, um, uh, you know, there's still a going concern. It's not a, I don't think there's a risk of them going bankrupt or anything because the, the they do have quarters in which they are making money. Uh, but uh, I see them as a fairly decent play here uh, if you can accumulate someplace between 350 and four maybe 410 that's what I'm doing not investment advice <laughs> <laughs> just what I'm doing see he keenly picked a price that we're not in right now <laughs> uh, yeah exactly. I, I wouldn't pay, I wouldn't buy it unless I still think we're in a downtrend. I mean, if you if you got it on the Renko cloud, you can see that we're still quite red. Uh, so I would not buy it, even if it you know starts going up here. You know, you gotta you have to have discipline and say, look, I'm not gonna buy it unless it hits you know that area. The reason I picked 350 is if you take a look at that most recent low. Uh, yeah, 3.25. You can see that that area just above there, like right around the 350 is the bottom of that Renko cloud. Yep, right in there. Yep. And that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, it's one of those, 
yeah, the weekly's definitely red still. We're in the downtrend. You start looking at the data, it's like, yeah, but look, it's going up. But guess what? Market doesn't like gaps. Yeah. Look at what it just did. Yeah, filled that gap. Filled that gap. Now it's going down. Yeah, I would not be surprised. I, I, I'm typically looking at the weekly, daily, and four hour, just the way you have it right there. And as long as the weekly is still, um, we got a uh, up signal on the on the price signals uh, on all three time frames, though. So, but I really like to see a little bit of a pullback to get in at a better price. Yeah, it's always nice to buy under the club. At, at this point, you'd be chasing it. Yes, exactly. I hate chasing. Don't chase. <clears throat> always tell yourself, reinforce that. I got to do it all the time. It's like, oh, look at that move. Get some. It's like, nope, don't chase it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Greater discipline. But I, I, I kind of like it. I like the way it looks. I just, I would like to get it at a better price. That's all. Yeah, where does that line up? So that's right at 364 is the bottom of the weekly cloud. Mm -hmm. So if we dip a little, little bit below that and we're still looking good on the daily and the, and the four hour, then that's a good place to buy, I think. Food for thought. There you go, guys. I like those beaten up stocks, though. So mm -hmm. we did really well on MGI. Uh, had a great run on it, MGI. From like 313 all the way up to uh, 650. That was a very nice run. Um, and that's pulled back now, and I'm not sure. Uh, and I'm accumulating anywhere in that, that 320 to, to, to four buck range again. Um, Looking for the next run up to maybe uh, just over 10 bucks or just under 10 bucks. It's just refueling. Yeah. Yeah, they had interesting discussions. I don't know if you saw the swell event. I did. did you see some of the videos out of there? I was following a bunch of that, you bet. Yeah. So they're, uh, they want to open new corridors. They're really, uh, they're very aggressively pursuing XRP as a settlement uh, asset for the cross-border payments. Uh, if they are successful in opening up new corridors, they can start bringing in some of that Nostro Bostro money. Uh, boy, that would be fantastic. Yeah, so they're, they're both in a hurry. Yeah. Uh, the big issue, uh, Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO of Ripple, was on um, interviewed at the New York Economic Club a couple weeks ago. Did you see that interview? Good. Yep. The only thing that's holding them up is regulations and some of the corridors. They need to have that clarity for the exchanges that they're going to be uh, dealing with. And uh, once that happens, and they can't wait, they are, you know, and uh, MoneyGram is ready to go. Yep, and hearing the words out of the CTO there, Mr. Schwartz, it sounds like they got all the bugs worked out. It's just a matter of ramping up volume now. That's exactly right, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. BXRP and I had a discussion, and now uh, DAI has also talked about it uh, publicly, so I guess I can say something. But they met a uh, very large, well-known bank out of the UK uh, representative who, um, and he, he was in a high position there, at the Swell Conference, who said they got billions, three hundred. They have they have three hundred plus billion dollars a day that they would love to run through ODL. Wow. Yeah, but they can't do it because of the regulations and some of their uh, corridors. But they're ready to go. As soon as reg regulation happens, man, they're they're going to take off. So that's pretty darn cool. They want to use it. Uh, and I think if they're probably not the only ones, right? If there's one, there's probably more and they want to use it. Hey, Walter says we're lagging behind from other countries who are actually spearheading the adoption here in the U S it's our government is the one holding, holding the adoption. I'm assuming you mean holding back. Yeah, ab absolutely. We are. And a lot of that is this is Dan's personal conjecture. Um, what they report to the public isn't always what you see under the covers. So we're probably a lot farther than we think we are. They just haven't told people about it. Yeah, I think so too. I don't think, 
unless they're, I mean, okay, I'll qualify that. <laughs> unless, unless they are not as intelligent as we think they are, um, and, and many of them are not that intelligent in, the, in, uh, in Congress um, or the Senate, but they have very smart people working for them. Yeah, they're not, that's not where the brains live. That's exactly uh, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they have very smart people working for them that are pushing this very, very hard, um, but also getting it, getting it right. And so that's going to take a little bit of time. And then they have to convince the congressman that this is the right move to make. Um, uh, but I still think that they think it's too risky for the average retail investor to be invested in. And so that's why they are being very cautious about whatever legislation they do pass. Um, um, and they're going to craft it. And I think in a way that will exclude some retail investors from actually diving more deeply into crypto. Um, they're waiting for BACT, which is the New York Stock Exchange uh, uh, new platform for uh, digital assets to really ramp up some volume. And um, I heard today, I think it was yesterday or today, that the custody solution that BACT had proposed was, was approved by the New York State Department of Financial Services now. Interesting. So that custody solution is a really, really, it's a much larger component to crypto adoption than, than, than everyone thinks. Right, for sure. You, know, you think about it. Every person who is invested in crypto should have, is doing their own custody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you got a manual ledger S. Or when I was in um, when I was in Las Vegas, uh, I, I purchased one of these cool bits. This is a cool wallet. In fact, I had promised Kristen Chu, the marketing manager. Come on, show and tell. She's the marketing manager for this company. Uh, I talked to her for the cool wallet. This is called the cool wallet. That I would unbox this thing on video. <laughs> but let's do it. Let's do it now. Well, there you go. Okay. What does this thing do? Okay. It, it is a wallet just like the Ledger Nano S, except it's much cooler. And that's why they call it the cool wallet, I guess. <laughs> Christmas but, come early. Um, now, they, had, um, they have a price on this of $99, which I think, in my opinion, is, is too much. Uh, you can get a Ledger Nano S now, um, not the blue. Bucks, I think. For forty nine bucks, right? Are they forty nine now? Okay. Yeah, so I think I think they're going to have to come down on their price. But uh, I was not given this for free, uh, but I did get a fairly substantial discount uh, from it. It's full disclosure, but I did pay for it. So let's open it up. It's got the shrink wrap on there. <laughs> Shankar, this is not Oprah. Everyone does not get a cool wallet. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, sorry guys. They didn't give me any extras. And I had, a, like I said, I had to pay for this one. And they were somewhat reluctant. They were somewhat reluctant to give me a discount on it until I showed them I had 7,000 Twitter followers. <laughs> All right, so, okay, so it's got this little seal on it. And that's actually kind of important because um, you don't want somebody tampering with your Ledger Nano S or this cool wallet or any of your uh, storage devices uh, for crypto because they could be tampered with. So let's kind of open this up. Pull that off. And then okay, pull this out. And that's what the, the cool well, it looks like it's basically the size. Have you ever seen one of these before? I haven't, no. It's the size of a credit card. Oh, look at that. Look how thin that is. It's the size of a credit card, and it has a little button there, which you just press, and it says, hello. It has a little, it says, please pair. So there is a app 
that you can download on your phone. So it's got a little, it's got a little battery life on there and it says, please pair. So you download the app to your phone and then uh, you can store all of your crypto. Look how thin that thing is. You can fit it in your wallet. So wow. you can have it with you at all time. Now they did tell me that if you lost this or if you destroy it for whatever reason, you sit on it or something like that, you simply get another one and you have recovery phrases that you can use in order on your app in order to reinstate it. Just like the nano, right? You got your 20 passwords yep. so you can, you're safe. Yep. That's the first thing, like you say, everyone's doing their own personal custody. Yep. They have to, there's not a way like I had, uh, someone's asked me that was on that edge, like they'd still think it's a scam. I'm like, whatever, dude, you can think it's a scam all you want. <laughs> I yeah, said, I um, you don't think there's going to be major governments running this if it's a scam. But uh, yeah, if you break it or you lose it, yeah, you have to have an answer for that. And that's exactly what it is. Yep, and inside the box is a um, a charging device uh, that you hook up to your phone uh, and a cable. So you got everything that you need there in order to activate the wallet. So if that thing's so small, where do you plug it in to charge it? Um, there's a wireless, wireless <laughs> charging. Oh, no, wait a minute, let me see. Uh, how does it work? Is it wireless charging maybe? Got a little no, in, in, in the little, there's a, in the little device that they have here, it's hard to see, uh, but you have this, uh, there's a little slot in there. There's a little slot in there. Oh, and you plug the card into that. And then, yeah, there's two connectors down here. There's two little Got it. buttons there, and you plug it into that. Okay. And then this, this gets plugged into your, to your phone. Interesting. So it's not Bluetooth enabled. Um, I don't want to use. I would not want that anyways, exactly right. Uh, but that, so now I've done the unboxing uh, for uh, Cool Wallet. That's pretty cool. Who's the company that makes that again? This is Cool Bit X. Same and thing, I wouldn't buy it from anyone except for the manufacturer directly. Yep, coolbitx.com. Nice. Yep. And, uh, uh, Kirsten, I'm sorry, I think I said Kirsten, it's Kirsten, Kirsten is her name. So um, she's very, very, very nice, very nice people, really, really down to earth and very friendly and uh, they were very happy to meet us all. Uh, Mr. B and D DAI were there at their booth and uh, we got a personal demonstration and talked to them for quite a while. I like their wallet, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, that's it. And um, uh, it, and also, uh, Yoshitaka Katao, who is a investor in Ripple, is also one of their supporters. He's also one of their investors. Uh, so very, very cool. But that brings me back to the discussion that why, I mean, you don't, you don't custody your own stock purchases. You know, if you're buying stock, you don't cust you don't take those shares anymore. You don't take those paper uh, shares, right? Right. You don't, you don't do that. And so that's why custody of digital assets is such a big deal, and which is also the reason why I think legislation has been uh, held up because there is no real good custody solution for retail investors yet. Yep, that's uh, that's the link. Cool. Uh, they cool claim wallet. Bluetooth, but like you said, I don't want the Bluetooth. Nah, I wouldn't do Bluetooth on. No. Disable it. What do they? What's the price on the Bluetooth? Oh, 150. The cool. Uh, the wallet S is cool. Yep. Yeah, I think eventually. I mean, the the cool wallet is very very nice because it's so thin. Um, well, and it's much handy. I can see why they made it this because that's what you're used to carrying. You know, a Nano right. doesn't fit in my money clip. Right, exactly. And so like I traveled for the last two weeks, I really had to think about what I was gonna do with my Ledger Nano S while I was gone. 
you know, what do I do with that? I put it in a bank, put it in a safe deposit box or something. Put it um, in a safe. Yep, at least I, a safe. I, yeah, at least a safe. I decided to uh, get a couple of tarantulas and bury it underneath their... Uh, <laughs> So there you go, seed creation, there you go. Just kidding. <laughs> One-time password algorithms, it's got a button on it. Yeah, it's a great little wallet, I like it. It's a good. Charging dock. Elliptical curve, yep, yep, I like seeing that. The geek in me is coming out, you gotta have elliptical curve. What is that? Yeah. What's an ellipt elliptical curve? Uh, that's a way of not having to keep generating and making massive key sizes before not making it reachable by computers. Elliptical curve is a newer technology. It's not really newer technology anymore, but it's just it's the latest things in what they call perfect forward secrecy and uh, just ways of doing encryption protocols. An elliptical curve is a way to predict things on the mathematical side of the house so you don't have to have a, because everything used to be make a bigger key. It was 256 key, then it was 512 and it's 1K and now we got two K keys and they're saying we have to go to four K keys and all this stuff. It's like, nope, it's not a matter of the key size. They came out with the electrical curve cryptography, which took away the requirement to, gener to drastically make larger keys. Because whenever you made a larger key, the computing power to do everything in the world completely changed. Right. So uh, it's good to see ECC. I can see that. Yeah, that, that would, I mean, yeah, if they keep uh, changing the key size, that's going to escalate the amount of, uh, computing power required to, to, to maintain those, right? Exactly. Just to do your standard decrypt, re-encrypt, normal processes, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So there you go. There's your there's your commercial. Hey, and don't miss the fun. <laughs> hey, hey, five bucks off. There you go. <laughs> 95. Maybe later. Yeah. All right. Well, gentlemen, we appreciate you joining us. We're probably getting close to a wrap on this one, so we missed you guys. It's so good to see you again. As you saw early on, there's still more things cooking, and uh, there's still more money to print because the market keeps going up. Yeah, I don't think it's going to last, so wait for a uh, turnaround today. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we close up maybe five or ten points. That's it on the Dow. Um, yeah, it's not up a ton. No, it's not up a ton. Because it was down overnight. Mm-hmm. Lots of movement overnight. Yeah. And the SPY VIX hasn't moved. So it looks like, uh, so that SPY VIX, if you, if you can open up a new chart and stick that in there, I think it's going to be interesting to watch. Here's, here's how I view that is that when the market makers do start want to take this down, they're going to start bidding up those prices on the, uh, on the uh, call options and the, and the put options on the S&P 500. And it's going to show up in that indicator. So uh, open up a new chart, put that SPY minus VIX times 24. Uh, in fact, I'll put the formula in here. This is on um, Thinkorswim platform. Uh, keep an eye on this, guys, uh, because I think what's, you're going to see this start to decline when uh, the mark, make it markers finally decide they want to take this down. Um, and you can put on the Renko Cloud on that. You can do the price, uh, the SM price indicator, uh, price signals, uh, and uh, keep an eye on that. That's, that's probably going to be the signal. There you go. It's by VIX 24 through the two on. For you guys to see, I'm just going to watch the recording. Yeah, the 30 minute is, is sensitive enough for me. A shorter time frame might be a little bit too sensitive, too much movement in there. Um, but the only thing I'm really looking at is right now it's at 8.34 or uh, whatever. I want to see that start to come down. I want to see start. I want to see the, uh, the price signal reflect that as well uh, and have that come down as well. So um, uh, it's not tied into internal market data. The price signals from strong market are based on the, uh, the actual price movement, uh, price movement of that, uh, of that index. Uh, so, you know, uh, when that starts to move lower, then you'll see the market move lower because uh, they're bidding up the prices of those puts and that's where they want to make their money. All right, guys, have a great one and uh, we'll see you again uh, Thursday. Good for you. I believe so. 
Awesome, man. I'll see you then. It's good to see you guys, all you guys again. Dan, always a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks, Shakar. Thanks, Greg. You guys have a great day. We'll catch you later on this week. Take care, guys. Bye. Peace.